uh, one of the last elements we're going to look at is an inertial element. So we've talked about proportional and damper or derivative elements and the last inertial element um, is going to be the most interesting. So once again let's go back to our simple step response applying a force to a spring. Um, in the first example we saw a proportional step up, in the second example we saw this slower response because it was a first order response, there was some, um, some friction, some energy loss in our system. The third thing that we're going to look at, these inertial elements, is what happens if the system has momentum. So this is, this is what you need to describe a system that has a mass, if you're looking at a mechanical system, or some form of induction in an electrical system. They are um, practically equivalent. And this is known as a second order response. It's when the response is proportional to the second time derivative, not the first time derivative. So what does that actually look like? Well, if we apply this force to a system um, with a proportional, a damper, and an inertial element, it looks something like this. And we can see things have changed a lot again. So we've still got this um, tailing towards some, some point up here. At the moment I've changed the gain just to make the plot a little bit clearer. So the gain here is 1. Um, we can see it takes us some time to arrive at that point, which is the time response we saw before. But we now get these oscillations that we've never seen before. And these oscillations are completely characteristic of a second order response, of a system with an inertial element. Essentially, if you are looking at some kind of black box system and it does this over time, you know straight away you're going to need an a, um, inertial element to accurately describe it. If it decays away over time, you'll need a damper element, and if it uh, steps up or steps down, you know it will need a proportional element as well. In the real world, most systems will require all three of these to get any kind of reasonably realistic response, and once again, this has a time constant. The important thing here is that we've got some kind of overshoot over time. Now the mathematics of this are slightly more complicated, but what you can hopefully see is we're actually doing exactly the same thing as we saw in the previous video. So we're assuming this is a linear time invariant system, which means we can describe it as a sum of a proportional, a damper, and an inertial element. And just like we did on the previous slide, my proportional turns into this, my damper look turns into this, and my inertial element looks like this and now I've just got a m here indicating my constant of proportionality for my inertial element. I do my tricky mathematical thing that you'll see in second year to make the equation easier to solve. I rearrange it and it gives me at the bottom down here it gives me a way of predicting the resultant position as a function of the input force, the constant of proportionality of the spring, constant of proportionality of the friction, the energy loss and the constant of proportionality of the inertial element. Now I might have to go through and find all these uh, values individually but it does allow me to calculate them to quite a degree of precision. So just using these three simple little tools we can combine them all together. If you're looking for specific examples in a mechanical system um, you can see we've got uh, our spring, a friction and a mass in here so car suspension is a fantastic example that has all of these components in it and you can't accurately model the behavior of it without all these three terms. And an electrical circuit if you've only got a capacitor in a circuit, you could model the whole thing just using uh, the spring relationship here. If instead you've got a capacitor and a resistor, so like every real world circuit will at least have a capacitor and a resistor, um, and if you add an inductor as well, you will start to see different behaviors in the systems. If you want to know the full story of solving these equations, um, there's a lot of tools to help you solve them using um, MATLAB or Python or if you want to know the full mathematical story, do Math244 at second year. Um, an alternative way of writing them is like this. I don't always have to write them in terms of multiple derivatives. I can start off with a slightly different value and express them in terms of integrals and derivatives instead. I just wanted to show you that these two are completely equivalent. They're just slightly different ways of describing exactly the same relationships depending on what value you start with. So here I start with the idea that x is the flow variable, x is the, sorry, x is the driving, the, the effort variable, the, um, the position here, uh, and over here that charge is my driving variable, uh, and, and over here instead of position I'm now using velocity, and instead of using charge I'm using current instead. 